Let me say this to you, Mr. Obama. You may have a pen and you may have a phone, no doubt an Obama phone. <laughs> but we have the Constitution of the United States. Saturday morning at National Harbor, closing out CPAC was the great one, Mark Levin. And of course, we have him every day, Monday through Friday, 6 to 9. And we have him right now. We're lucky. Joining us live from the bunker in Northern Virginia. Mark Levin, thanks for joining us this morning. Well, it's a pleasure, Larry. It's great to see you. Brian, how are you? I'm doing well. Good to have you on. It was great to see you, and you were mobbed by people there after your speech. And uh, you spent a lot of time uh, posing for pictures and talking to people. Were you surprised that so many young people? People were at CPEC and really seemed to be attracted to your message. You didn't uh, uh, pull any punches. I think anyone who knows you uh, knows that you wouldn't. But uh, you were you were pretty solidly, uh, uh, you know, Im explicit about your feelings about the president and, frankly, the Republican Party. First of all, I think the young people out there are yearning for leadership. Not for me. I'm not running for anything, but. They haven't heard a message about liberty and opportunity. They haven't heard a message against big centralized government and phony freebies and the welfare state. They don't get it in college, they don't get it in high school, and they don't get it from Republicans. So this is the message I try to get across. We attack young people in this country. We never give them an opportunity to hear a strong, principled message. We never give them an opportunity to actually vote for a conservative, which is something that's very exciting and invigorating. Yeah. Uh, instead, we get these guys that talk into their chests and are very monotone and talking about amendment to a procedure to a this and a that. The other thing is, um, look, I'm very, very concerned, as you guys are, about what's going on in this country. And there's a reason these things are going on. We have a president who doesn't give a damn about the Constitution and Republicans who are so fearful about standing behind it that there are really no more effective checks on this man. And so now we turn to the courts. Oh, well, the court do this, the court do that. Two things. Number one, Congress has an independent duty under the Constitution to stop this. And number two, we can't rely on the courts. The courts are now going to impose marriage, a certain type of marriage on the nation. And the, the courts upheld Obamacare. We may win this one case that's coming up. We're involved in that. But you can't, you can't break up the Constitution that way. So, you know, look at this mess with DHS right now. This all came about because the moment... Boehner became speaker, and he pushed this piddly continuing resolution through. He started the mantra, we Republicans will not shut down the government. The moment Mitch McConnell was reelected in November, the next day he said, we Republicans will not shut down the government. Two things. They're preemptively smearing themselves. So even though they're not the ones shutting down the government, they just put the mantra out for the Democrats. So the Democrats actually, by their votes in the Senate, would quote-unquote shut down the Department of Homeland Security. But the Republicans are responsible for it. This is the sick mentality that goes on in Washington. Number two, yeah. that damn thing doesn't shut down. That damn thing never shuts down. Eighty-three percent of the personnel there are essential under a separate federal statute. They don't get to go home. So the Border Patrol will be patrolled to the extent that Obama allows it. There will be TSA. There will be Secret Service. It was hilarious on a Friday night. I'm sitting behind the microphone, and they're saying DHS will shut down at midnight. I said... DHS has shut down. It's 5 p.m. on Friday. Everybody yeah, no, left. Well, well, you're right about that. And, and the 30,000 or so employees who would be furloughed, well, that really, that's just like a paid vacation because you know that eventually when it gets resolved, they're going to be paid for their time. That's so true. It's you, the way you, it always works. You are right on. Uh, Brian, ask the plumbers, the electricians, the guy that runs a sandwich shop like I did this week. You know, when it snows, it's icy, people don't go out, they don't get paid back. They lose their money. That's right. If they're shuttered, they lose their money. If Obamacare puts them out, nobody pays them back. We're so government centric; it's just unbelievable. All right. So, uh, look, how do you? What's the end game there? How does this get resolved? Because there's a report out there that Boehner's about to cave on this. No way. Uh, and what do you think should happen? I say no way because I know he will. I'll tell you what should happen. What should happen is you ready for this, Brian? You're not going to like this. No, I like. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'll like it. They should abolish or suspend the filibuster rule for the pendency of this president. Reid already did it in part when it came to judges. And they should do it because the filibuster rule is not in the Constitution. They should do it to defend the Constitution. Here's why. Obama and Harry Reid are using a small minority of Democrat senators to, to ruin the Senate. 
to block the Senate. They can't even get a vote. They can't even get amendments on. There will not be any discussion. This is a, a, a game that Obama and Reid are playing. They don't care about the Senate. And I say this. The Republicans should stand up and say, we will suspend the filibuster rule until this president leaves because of how he is eviscerating the Constitution in, in coordination with Harry Reid, and then pass it and send it to him and make him veto it. It needs to be clear who's doing what, and that's part of the important thing in getting the message across to the American people. Uh, Mark Levin, last time we had you on, we spoke about the movement toward the convention of the states, and I heard a lot of people from the main stage at CPAC talking about that and advocating for that. What's the status of the convention of the well, states, you know, Article as, 5 convention? As much as I'd like to be in charge of this process, I'm not. I, I, I wrote a book about it, a fairly thorough, you know, did a lot of scholarship on that. I was originally opposed for it. Now I'm 100% supporting it, and it's uh, it's moving. It's moving slowly. People need to learn more and more about it. There are organizations and individuals, putatively conservative, who really don't get it. They'd rather complain about what's going on in Washington and just say, well, elect a few more Republicans and that'll fix it. It won't fix it. These problems are ingrained in the federal system now. And one of the things I said at CPAC is we don't have a federal republic. We don't have a constitutional republic. We don't have a representative republic. Most of the laws that are passed are passed by the bureaucracy. The states have almost no meaning if the federal government steps in, whether it's immigration or health care or whatever it is. And in terms of the Constitution, when you have a president brazenly bragging that, look, I'll do what I want through executive orders, and if Congress acts, you know, too bad, I'll blow it off. You, this, this, this is, these are extremely yeah, potent are. times. So the way to handle that is for the state legislatures to get together and propose changes, just the way Congress can propose changes. You still need three-fourths of the states to ratify. It's slow. It's an education process. But in the end, it's the only alternative we have. All right, one minute left, and I want you to give me who you thought were the big winners and the big losers at CPAC. Who impressed you? Who not so much? All right, don't get mad at me. I didn't watch all these speeches. You know, <laughs> I would say this. From what I did see, there was no great winner out of the group. They all sounded pretty good. Um, but there's no great standout. I haven't seen a great standout in a long time. Uh, what, what will matter to me is not the speech they give. It's the record they have and where they intend to take the country. And if they can communicate it in a way uh, that will resonate with the American people. And the Reagan Democrats, that is the yeah. hardworking guys who work on assemblies and drive trucks. We need these people this time around. You know, I've seen a lot of surveys of late that suggest that the middle is grabbable again, that, mm -hmm. they, that they are up for something new and different. The middle is only grabbable again if they're presented with American conservative principles in an intelligent and ineffective and knowledgeable way by a relatively charismatic leader. The American people are yearning for a pro-American leader. That's what they're yearning for. Mark, uh, they're also learning for a leader on the international stage, and tomorrow we'll see Benjamin Netanyahu Amen. here in Congress. Uh, speaking to Congress, what do you take? Uh, well, you we only have 30 seconds, but Dianne Feinstein yesterday uh, said that he was arrogant yeah. and that he didn't speak for the Jewish community. You, you're Jewish, Mark Levin? First of all, talk about arrogant. She, she's the definition of arrogant. I would say this. Benjamin Netanyahu represents more Americans than Barack Obama when he speaks to tomorrow. <laughs> and, and I will also say this. Uh, the liberal Democrat Jewish community is a disgrace. They keep funding and supporting these, these uh, Israel haters. And now you even have right. Feinstein. Feinstein does. Who represents Jews? Where, where is this meeting? Where is this vote? I don't get to go. <laughs> she sure as hell doesn't. No. All right, Mark Levin, we've got to leave it there. And if you want more, you know where to find it. Six to nine every, every night, night here on yeah. WMAL. Thanks, thank guys. you, Mark. Mark, thank you very much. A great pleasure.